Thank you. It is a great day to be a father. It is a great day to be a man. And an even greater day to be a man of God. Amen. I'm going to... Um, it's probably going to shift a little bit. <laughs> I really don't know what's going on right now. I was sitting there saying, Lord, what's going on? But um, <laughs> let's do something spiritual. Let's just pray. Father, we just ask right now, God, that you speak, that you have your way today, that you will be done. As you've declared it in heaven, let it be done in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Men of honor and men of the kingdom. This past week, I was talking with one of our Zozo ministers, and she made this statement. Pastor, I don't know of any woman or man that I've met with that hasn't had father issues. I could say after talking to, and I don't think with any exaggeration, um, uh, probably almost 2,000 women, 2,000 men in the military. I counsel six, seven people a day. and I do counseling in and out all the time. Is that fathers are probably one of the major issues that, that we face in our society today. The absentee rate of fathers from the home is crazy. Even if you had a good father, there were things in your life that you may have felt at some time that he didn't care, he didn't love. I think what God is doing across the body of Christ now is that he is raising men. They'll get the ringing out in a minute. That he is raising men of God to step up to the plate and to be who God called them to be. I think we're getting ready to see such a move among men. It's not going to be a promise keepers thing, but it's going to be something much deeper. Promise keepers was a great movement and, and, and you know, tens of thousands gathered and, and, and God did some remarkable things. But what God is not looking for is something that is fleeting but something that men and women will step into. So I guess I go evangelist on you. Amen. Come on. Bring it on, Pastor. <laughs> so we're going to find ourselves. Let me cut this one off here just to make sure I don't get any back up. Is we find ourselves in a culture that does not have a clear definition of what a man is. Our society is changing the definition of a man. Our society is trying to make men effeminate. It is trying to change the core of who God made us. In Genesis 1, it says that God created man and woman in his image. See, God made me. When he made me a man, he made me a man. I've never questioned that. My wife's never questioned that. I'm created, you as a man are created in the image of God to bring a reflection of God's glory into this world. I've got to be. I know. They really were praying for me as I was teaching in class this morning. I got a little excited. God help me right now. Psychologists, sociologists, theologians all agree that the greatest problem that we're facing today is the lack of a family, the lack of a role of a man and woman. Did you notice out of the children this morning, there were three, at least three, if not four, said, I want to thank you all for being a father to me for stepping into my life to demonstrating what a godly father is about. I want to tell you that is such a privilege and such an honor. Chris Valton said that he was three years old when his father died in a, uh, a drowning accident in a boat. Storm came up, the boat capsized. 
his dad passed and his mom remarried and she remarried twice and and she she remarried two very abusive men um, who were alcoholics and Chris Valton hardly knew a day that he wasn't cussed or hit or beat in some way. But Chris Valton's grandfather, and I guess I need to, I need to give you the front of the story that um, his grandfather on his father's side, his son got his mother pregnant out of wedlock. They married, and the father said, I, the grandfather said, I never want to see you again. So the son comes back after a period of time, and he, he gets on his knees, and he said, Dad, I repent. His dad wasn't a godly man. He said, Dad, I'm sorry. I repent. And he said, and God reconciled that relationship. When his father died in the boating accident, his grandfather took a special interest in Chris. Now, Chris was mischievous. And I'm going to relate one story because I'm, I want to go back what being a man's about. His, fa- his grandfather wasn't a Christian at this point. Chris was probably about nine years old, and his grandfather bought him a hammer, so he hammered every nail he could possibly hammer. And then he decided he wanted to build a go-kart, so he goes to the garage and he starts pulling off wood. <laughs> and then he takes the wheels off the lawnmower and he... He nails them into the wood to make a cart, a go-kart. Well, his mom gets home, and he's so proud of what he did, and she grabs him by the neck and said, wait till your grandfather gets here. He's going to kill you. So as soon as the grandfather pulled up, he had come in from work. The mom grabs him by the neck, and he says, (laughs) she says, now tell him what you did. And Chris eventually gets around, and he says, I built this, and he said, where did you get the wood? He said, from the garage, and his grandfather looked at the garage, and there was sunlight coming through. He said, well, I guess I'm going to have to go get some plywood for that. He said, well, where did you get the wheels? He said, I took them off your lawnmower, and he said, well, that was pretty ingenious. He says, unless you and I get in, we'll go to the hardware store. We'll get some axles and some wheels, and we'll make this the best go-kart you can possibly be. See, his dad chose, his grandfather chose not to stifle the growth and the creativity in his grandson. He goes on later to tell the story that his grandchildren were at the house and one had hit the door and the other and the garage door is coming down and he hollers out and the garage door gets off of track. And he started to raise his voice, and his wife looked over him, and he said, Grandfather. (laughs) And Chris calmed down and said, We can fix that. See, our job as men is to mentor younger men and to young, love children with the love and the heart of the Father. I don't know what kind of father you had, but I want to tell you, He's nothing compared to our Heavenly Father who is full of love and full of grace and full of mercy. God loves you more than you can comprehend. And so we have to reach that point in our life that we're willing to say, God, I want to be the man that you called me to be. And I believe that God is calling men to the new standard. I believe that God is saying, rise up and fulfill the calling and the destiny that's on your life. Be who I called you to be. Walk in the fullness of everything that I called you to walk in. That is, if you're married, men, you are to love your wife and you are to love her as Christ loved the church. And how did he love the church? He gave his life for the church. I've not always done that. I was talking with someone this morning, and we were talking about why is it in in our latter years of life we really begin to understand what's important in life? Why is it that we demonstrate more grace as we get older with people than we did when we were parents? See, as a father, I would do so many things different.
I wouldn't work 80 hours a week when I didn't have to. I wouldn't have been at the beck and call of everybody and leave in a moment's notice. When my daughter said she wanted to move back home a couple of years ago, I was so excited because I said, God, you've given me another chance to love her unconditionally and to speak life into her again and again. Almost every day I'll look at her and I'll say, baby, have I told you? And she just gets a smile on her face. Because I used to tell her, and I really meant it, when she was a little girl, and I said, I, I love you. You're every daddy's dream of a little girl. There's nothing I would change about you, even if I could. I, I love you. Finally, she asked me to stop saying that, and then I went through a major crisis in my life, and, and for a number of years, our, our relationship was very strained. I couldn't say that, and she believed it, but now when I say that, she'll just grin because she knows that I love her and adore her. So, fathers, I'm challenging you today, whether you're young or whether you're older, Speak life into your children. Speak hope into your children. Yes, your job is to correct them, but your job is to love them unconditionally, to speak life and not death into them, to bring them to the fullness of who God created them to be. God has called you and I for such a time like this, and, and God has given me the privilege of having lots of sons and daughters and, and grandchildren. I don't have any... You know, for my kids, yes, and we want them in God's timing, but uh, we have grandchildren. And I love on those kids. They've got us wrapped around their finger. One of them is Jeremiah and Gracie, and I can go on Carolina, and, you know, I can just go on. My great niece, Augusta Rose, what a great southern name. See, God has called me to love. And as a father, I'm called to, to speak forth and to bring those things into the fullness of everything that God has for them. This is going to be the hard part. But God said, I want you to talk about your pain. On our bookshelf, I was looking for a particular book in our bedroom. And I pulled down one called Butterfly Kisses. You remember the song. My daughter wrote probably at nine or ten years old. She said, you're the best dad. You're a godly. I love you so much. I looked and found one that my son had given me, and he had said the same thing. Then I made some wrong decisions. It cost me a career. It almost cost me my family. And it cost me the respect and the love of my children and my peers. And God said, I want to take and I want to restore you and make you into the man that I've called you to be. See, we can get called, so called up in our identity, in our job, in our position in our pride and our arrogance, our sin and our hurt and everything else, that we will not let the Holy Spirit of God speak to us. And what God is saying to you men here today, whether you're young or whether you are old, deal with your stuff because I want to use you to bring life into everyone that you come in contact with. I want to tell you that my relationship is... 
been restored. My marriage is stronger than it's ever been. I am faithful to my wife. I am faithful to my wife. I am faithful to my wife. She said to me two years ago, she said that you're finally the man I've always wanted to marry. Now, before I would have gotten pretty upset. But I want to tell you that God has called us to such a time as this where marriages are ending at unprecedented rates. God is calling men to step up to the plate and be who God called you to be. He is calling you to be a man of character and a man of integrity. And that if you are dealing with things, then get the help. Everybody's got their stuff, but God wants you to get rid of your stuff so you can be who he called you to be. Amen? <laughs> Us men are a funny bunch. Yeah, <laughs> too many women saying amen. We just don't get it, women. We just don't. But what God is saying today is I want you, men, to be an example of my love to the world. I've got some black marks here. My wife, I think, said, or somebody said, well, why don't you buy a new yellow shirt? And these are general stripes to me at a street meeting in Mexico. I hugged a prostitute and told her through an interpreter how much God loved and she cried and her mascara is still on there. So every time I, I put this shirt on, I look at it and I remember that God touched a woman of the night <laughs> and made her into a daughter of God. We've got to get rid of our pride. We've got to get rid of this self-sufficiency. God is looking for men who will come to the forefront and say, yes, I was this, but I am no longer that. I am on my way to complete and do everything that God has called me to do. I'm criticized about the, by a lot of people about my insistence on healing ministry here, cleansing stream, and we've had people leave the church on cleansing stream. We've had people manifest on cleansing stream, which is a clear indication they're where they were supposed to be. But see, I prayed and I fasted. And I can't tell you how many books I read. I don't know of anybody, I'm sure there was, that who prayed or fasted more than I did. But it took somebody from the outside to come in and speak into my life and lead me to a place of freedom. Even though Jesus Christ had accomplished it 2,000 years ago, I had preached, I had ministered, I'd seen people healed, I'd seen people set free. God says, I want you free to do freedom for other people. My life as I knew it came to an end because I had a fellow minister who was very jealous and very angry come against me and spoke some truth but a lot of lies about me and God said this is my judgment this is my judgment you are not to say a thing and when you know Papa speaks like that you're silent God said, I'm going to rebuild you, Greg Lewis, into the man that I called you and created you to be. It's time that men step up to who God called them to be. It's time that we love our wives unconditionally, that we love our children unconditionally, that we love others that God brings into our path with a passion. How God loves you, you are to love them. I do want to read this statistic. Jonathan and Sarah Edwards, the great revivalist, put a high emphasis on training their children in the things of God. 
A study was done of two different men. Out of Edward's descendants, one U.S. vice president, three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 65 professors, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, and 100 missionaries. Pretty good, pretty good heritage, right? The same study examined a man known as Jukes, J-U-K-E-S, in 1877 while visiting New York's prison, Richard Dugall found inmates with 42 different last names all descending from one man called Max. Born around 1720 of Dutch stocks, Max was a hard drinker, idle, irrelevant, and uneducated. This is his descendants. Seven murderers, 60 thieves, 50 women of the night, 130 convicts, 310 paupers, who spent a, a total of 2,300 years in the poorhouse, and 400 physically wrecked by in, uh, indulgent living. The Duke's descendants cost the state more than $1,250,000 at that time. I don't know what your past has been, but I want to tell you what your future is. If you allow God to do what he wants to do in your life, if you submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, if you begin to break off those things that are generationally, those things that have been passed on, we see a clear thing in scriptures what happened here, right? And we begin to speak life and we begin to train and teach our children in the things of the Lord, then we will break what has been passed down to us. A lot of what happened to me was came down generationally at least two generations. When I broke that off, I learned that I had to break it off, that I could break it off, that I could be healed, that I could be set free, then it's amazing what God does. Amen? But, it, but I don't want you to have to go to the point of failure, to the point of complete brokenness, that you finally listen to what God has to say. And I'm going to close with this. My first closing, anyway. <laughs> my son said to me, and, his, and I've, I've shared this before, and I love my son. I love my son. He said, Dad, do I worry you? I said, no, boy, you don't worry me. I call him boy. He said, why not? I said, the doctor caught you. The, war, the nurse wiped you, and the moment I held you, I lifted you to God, and I dedicated. And I said, your granddaddy, who's the most godly man I've ever known, took you between family and friends and lifted you before the Lord. I said, there are thousands upon thousands of prayers that have gone out for you. I said, son, God's hand can either be the safest and the greatest place to be, or it can be the most painful place to be because God disciplines his sons. I said, you get to choose your pain level. <laughs> oh, Dad, you always got to be the preacher. So I, I just want you to know how much Father loves you. And for all of you boys and girls and men and women who were abused, either verbally or physically or sexually by a father and authority figure. I am so sorry that that happened to you. But I want to tell you, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of men and women get free, get healed, and no longer have to deal with the pain that comes from being violated. So as a man, as a person in authority, I, on behalf of all mankind, apologize to you who were abused or hurt or shamed 
in any way. I ask you to forgive me on behalf of somebody else. There's your freedom, people. God is wanting to do some healing today. Men, we need to look inward and see what the Holy Spirit of God is saying. And then we need to look upward to Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. And then when it's time, we need to look outward and bring healing to everyone who has been damaged and hurt by life. God has called us men to be a father to the fatherless. To love. If, if you ever watched Noah, he said thank you to all the men at church. If you ever watch me with Noah, he will, if he gets two feet with me, I grab him in a headlock. With the girl, little girls, I grab them and I love them and I look at them in the eye and I just tell them how beautiful and how special they are. See, we have the power in our mouth to speak life and to call forth the gold in their life. No matter what they've heard, we recognize God in them. Amen? At this time, we're going to play a, a, a short video. Is it ready, Owen? And then I'm going to close in a prayer. change your life if you let them. For they come from the very heart of God. He loves you. And he is the father you have been looking for all your life. This is his love letter. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I'm familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered, for you were made in my image. In me, you live and move and have your being. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake. For all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb brought you forth on the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand, for I am your provider and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope, because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are 
countless as the sand on the seashore. And I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you. For you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul. And I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart. For it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine. For I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are broken hearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your Father, and I love you even as I love my Son Jesus. For in Jesus my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me. And nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father. And will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? for you. Love, your dad, Almighty God. Taken from his very words to you today, I have always been your father. I challenge you today to let God become the father you've always longed for, that you've always wanted, if you have not. I joke around partly and say I'm as favored as I am, but you are too. That he would move heaven and earth for me. And he asks you and I just simply to come and to acknowledge his love and his grace and his mercy to you. Sometimes we may have to forgive. And I've had a lot of practice at that. And my wife has had even more practice at that. But I wanted to be raw and honest before you today. Because I want to tell you that the life that you have lived and the place that you have failed does not have to define your future. In one book I read, it was a, a Christian novel that says, how do you take care of the wrongs that you've done in your past? You take and you live your day different to reach out to other people. Yesterday is yesterday. But today God is calling his church, the men and the women of God, to become who he's called you to be. It is a great calling. And I want to tell you, and I've been, had to experience this, Again and again, I've never doubted God's love for me again. And we'll have some visitors, so I'm going to say this one more time because it was a significant event. 
I had a really bad day as a pastor. I don't know what was going on. But I came walking through these double doors, and I get to about where Mike is. And God just literally, it was like a, a big hot bucket of warm honey love hit me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I didn't weep. I wailed because I felt the pure love of God. And as I was weeping and as I was crying, I looked up to heaven because we're all religious. <laughs> Just get over it. I looked up to heaven. I said, God, how can you love me? I have the degrees, you know, I've got the badges. And he said, Greg, I've always loved you. I will always love you. And there's nothing that you can ever do that would make me love you less. He said, I've called you by name in your mind. I want to tell you that day religion left me. As you walked in out there, it says experience God. We've got too many people walking with a head knowledge of God and people who haven't experienced the love and the grace of God. They read about it. They can quote it. But their hearts are far from him. And then the other thing that you see on the wall, it says to love people. All people. The woman of the night on the street in Mexico. The people that we come in contact every day that you are repulsed by and you say are unlovable. God says, I want you to love them because I love them. They're created in my image. They are my pre-Christian sons and daughters of God. It changes your perspective, people. Everything you have is because of God's grace and God's mercy. You're sitting in Rafa, or if you're listening on the, on the Internet, whatever you have is by the grace and the mercy and the gifting of God. What you have, He has given you, and it makes you no better than the guy on the street other than you have recognized God, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior. He wants you to reach out and to love other people. So I'm going to ask you to stand. And I want you to repeat after me. It's between you and God. Heavenly Father, I repent for not believing that you loved me, that you cared for me, and that I blamed you for all the bad stuff that's happened in my life. I confess it is sin. And I ask you to forgive me. Heavenly Father, I choose to forgive my earthly father for everything they did that hurt me, brought pain, or shamed me. I choose to forgive them and release them to you. Heavenly Father, I choose to forgive all male authority figures who have hurt me in any way. I choose to forgive them, and I ask that you bless them in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I choose to be the son or the daughter of God that you have called me to be. I ask you, Holy Spirit of truth and revelation, 
that you would speak to my heart, that you would change me, that I may bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to tell you right now, if you prayed that in sincerity, you are different. When God shows you something, that's how you deal with it. I'm teaching you something. When God shows you something in your life that's not right, where there's anger or lust or anything else, you recognize it for what it is, sin. You confess it as sin. You ask God, you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you, you ask the Holy Spirit to indwell and empower you, and then you move out. And if you fall again, you get up again. And you get up, and you get up, and eventually, one day, I'm no longer be a problem. Eventually, one day, and it can happen immediately. See, I was delivered of alcohol or drugs, never had an issue with that. Never. You know, I was an alcoholic, I did drugs. God delivered me like that, but there was something else in my life that I had to get deliverance from. Because it was something generationally that was passed down to me. So I challenge you men and women of God, become who God called you to be. You deserve everything that God has for you because God gave everything for you. Amen? With that, I'm going to say, God bless you. I love you. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. For all the future fathers, happy Father's Day. And if you aren't a father yet, or if you are a father, or you're a grandfather, find some young person and love them into the kingdom. Call out the gold in their life and tell them how special they are in God's eyes. You can make the difference. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.